Good morning, everyone, and thank you for allowing me to open this year's focal meeting with a discussion of the rationale for focal therapy. I think this audience probably knows a lot about the rationale for focal therapy, but maybe we can review some topics that'll set the tone for the meeting. My name is Samir Taneja. I'm a faculty at NYU, and I'm very sorry that I can't be at this year's meeting. I would have loved to join you all. Thank you to Arvind George and Abhinav Sadana for the invitation, and I hope I can be there in person for the next one. A few of my disclosures are listed. It's important to know that I do help companies design trials for focal therapy, as this has been of interest of mine for over a decade. Why consider focal therapy? Well, it, we all know it's rooted in the desire to be able to treat prostate cancer without inducing as much side effect and peripheral damage, which may affect the quality of life of our patients. Radical prostatectomy, radiation have greatly improved over the years, but the reality is they still have significant risk of side effects. Importantly, timing is right for a paradigm shift in our field. There's been a de-escalation of treatment with global adoption of active surveillance, and we have a number of tools which have allowed us uh, to uh, better characterize uh, the disease, including its risk, extent, and location. We know the natural history of the disease is long, and ultimately the timing of treatment may be the real issue at hand rather than the necessity for treatment and a one size fits all is probably not appropriate for this disease. We get typical criticisms when we talk about focal therapy, the fact that disease is multifocal, you can't see it all, and how can you really decide if what you're doing is beneficial? I think there are some critical concepts you have to adopt if you are going to ultimately accept focal therapy as a treatment option. One is that the therapeutic goal is very distinct from conventional therapy. It's more of a disease management strategy and that we're not really saying we're gonna treat all the known cancer. Our goal is really to mitigate the risk of metastasis and mortality through treatment of the disease that's most relevant. Follow-up can be difficult and you really have to be diligent about imaging and detection of recurrence as early as possible. And the approach really has to be in considered investigational. We should all be learning as we go and informing our approach through our observations. The basis of focal therapy lies in the idea of a clonal origin of metastasis. Uh, and this dates back to a paper published over a decade ago, and I think it was really Hash Ahmed who drew the relevance of this paper to the field. In that, uh, it, it appears that most metastases, if you really type them, they, they go back to one clonal origin in the prostate. So they all may be different at a genetic level, but ultimately they seem to have one parent clone. If that's the case, then identification of that index lesion would allow us to mitigate or remove the risk for metastasis. Uh, there's been an old literature which really characterized the idea of non-index lesions as being small, rarely outside the prostate capsule, rarely of high Gleason score, and as such, the concept of an index lesion is very appealing. Now, there are controversies in this regard. One is how do you define the index lesion? We know that MRI has been utilized, but should it be highest Gleason score? Should it be largest tumor volume? And there's conflicting literature now that shows that on whole mount correlative studies from radical prostatectomy, non-index tumors may be high grade more often than we think. Now, whether these are men who truly would have been considered for focal therapy is an important question, but I think we still don't totally understand the true significance of the disease we leave behind. It's also important to note that significant disease we often leave behind may be related to the actual index tumor. These are not round tumors, and cancer may sit in the umbra or the penumbra of the tumor as people refer to and, and as will be discussed later in this meeting, our own experience has been that when we use MRI to identify an index lesion, cancer that's clinically significant, that's missed by the target uh, sample is most often ipsilateral and therefore adjacent to the target lesion. Now in conventional therapy, we tend to segregate patients into favorable, unfavorable and high risk. Focal therapy has a potential role or proposed role in all of these settings. It could be used in the low risk patient 
to prevent clinical progression and therefore delay active treatment. It could be used as an alternative to active radical treatments for patients with unfavorable disease, or it could be included in a multimodal approach to high-risk disease as a less toxic local regional intervention. The FDA has taken a strong position in the United States that they tend to believe, based on the results of a public workshop, that the first paradigm is the most appealing for testing the validity of the paradigm, that perhaps surveillance plus an intervention might avoid local progression and secondarily radical therapy, and this may be adequate for approving a technology for use in this space. The benefit of using such an approach is that it limits the potential for undertreatment in low-risk disease. Uh, it, uh, it allows clean endpoints for comparative trials. Uh, it can be applied to a large cohort of men, but I think there are risks here. One is that we end up treating men who may never have needed it. It's not without a cost. And surveillance outcomes are often really good uh, regardless of what you do. So can you really improve upon the oncologic care of those men? And finally, it potentially underachieves in the potential for focal therapy in our field. Use of focal therapy in an unfavorable intermediate risk population is perhaps more appealing. It treats people who need it. It avoids radical therapies, morbidity and effects on quality of life and you can salvage most often in those who recur, as I'll discuss tomorrow. But the risks may be that you would undertreat someone with curable disease and lose your window, and early disease clearance may not necessarily predict long-term benefit. Use of focal therapy as a therapeutic and high risk is somewhat controversial, but it's logical, perhaps. You're using a local intervention which avoids radical morbidity but at the same time is embedded within a multimodal approach in men who are very likely to have systemic failure at some point. The risk here is that you, again, may undertreat men with potentially curable disease. There are a subset who would have been cured by radical treatment alone. And local disease here is often bulky and regionally advanced and not appropriate for focal intervention. Potential endpoints for measuring efficacy and benefit are challenging in the field of focal therapy. Uh, Recurrence-free survival, clinically significant cancer-free survival, progression-free survival, these are the things we often use. We look at the local response as a surrogate of long-term benefit. But in fact, metastasis-free survival and overall survival have yet to be measured in these patients with any adequate long-term follow-up. It's very challenging to know that we're really doing something good. So what does it take for focal therapy to succeed? Well, it takes adequate local ablation. This is the most critical piece. Pay attention to your margins, be selective regarding the focality, the size, the location of the index tumor, and choose your energy source wisely depending on the nature of the individual tumor. Be rigorous in monitoring for recurrence. I always say that Lazy follow-up is good for our outcomes, but it's not really good for our patients. Early failures can be salvaged with repeat ablation. Late failures cannot. And record your outcomes. Learn from your own experience and inform your process. Disease focality influences the likelihood of success. Unifocal patients are ideal, but they're rare. Multifocal patients with a single index lesion that's significant that's the sweet spot that we most often treat, knowing that we're probably leaving low-risk disease behind elsewhere in the gland. Disease location is a technical issue to consider. Anterior tumors are ideally situated for ablation. You can achieve a wide margin around them. They're well adapted to needle-based ablations. Postromedial tumors can be a bit challenging. They're close to the rectum, the urethra, so use of a warming catheter may prevent adequate treatment. Posterolateral tumors are, of course, closest to the nerve bundle, and this plays into a more conservative approach with ablation. And finally, apical tumors, most difficult to treat because they're in a high traffic area. How do we select patients? We can do it based on biopsy. The early days, a simple systematic biopsy often led to a unilateral treatment. But in fact, when you do that, you have to overcome the poor localization by treating larger areas of disease, and you still may end up with recurrence. Transperineal template mapping biopsy, this is probably the gold standard. 
It'll identify accurately the extent of disease, the location of the disease, but I think it's unclear if all the disease needs to be treated, and this will likely reduce the number of candidates who ultimately can be treated. In my mind, MRI is not perfect, but it's very good. It identifies dominant disease in the majority of diagnostic cases, and the significance of the missed disease remains uncertain. We've published long ago that if you see a tumor on MRI, it often underestimates the extent of the disease on histology. And so focusing your ablation on what you see will leave you with residual tumor that's likely to recur. So one has to really tailor the ablation with a margin. We've shown the ideal margin is about nine to 10 millimeters. And we tailor our ablation accordingly to minimize the risk of local recurrence. Energy sources play into that, and I'll talk about that a little bit more tomorrow. But in fact, uh, some energy sources can provide very focal ablation. This would allow you better treatment along the nerve bundle or the apex, but they're less confluent in my opinion. Those that allow more confluent destruction of larger tumors, those will obviously be less focal and be more uh, at risk of thermal dispersion. Retreatment is a strength of the focal therapy paradigm, and we should be eager to identify early recurrences and retreat. My own experience with focal cryo when we last look, disease-free survival is rare, but if we look at clinically significant disease-free survival, even by seven years, we see good local regional control. Repeat ablation occurs often, and the overall retreatment rate's about 50% in my series as you get further out but most often that's a repeat ablation and radical treat retreatment is less common occurring at a more delayed interval. We'll discuss that a little bit more in detail tomorrow, but the point here is that in fact, retreatment should be considered to be part of the disease management strategy uh, at, rather than failure. It may just indicate a need for further treatment and, 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 and completion of treatment effectively. So in conclusion, I think the rationale for focal therapy is strong. There's a low, it's a lower risk treatment with regard to quality of life. It has potential for durable local control, potential for retreatment with limited toxicity. There are emerging tools to improve localization. And I think one should simply plan for success. Carefully select your patients based upon disease risk and focality. Dr. Sedana is gonna discuss appropriate candidate selection. Emerging tools will help us with localization. Uh, and, and I think that we can be very careful about who we choose. Carefully select your ablative modality based on location and size of tumor and poorly located disease should simply be avoided. I'll look forward to watching online some of the lectures and learning more from all of you. And I'll be back tomorrow to talk a little bit more about my experience with recurrence and management of recurrence. Thanks very much.